Noel Paul Stuckey is a member of the, uh, the folk music group, Peter, Paul, and Mary. A few years ago, he, he, he made an observation on how he felt the focus of society was changing throughout the years. And he said it was noticeable even in the magazines that, that were popular. Said when he was a young man, the most popular magazine was Life Magazine. Anybody remember Life Magazine? Said Life Magazine covered the entire spectrum of life. It, it, was, it was very broad and, and, and it looked at people and things and interests and it was very broad in its appeal. He said 10 years later, though, he noticed the focus beginning to change. He said the most popular magazine 10 years later was People magazine. He said, well, it's true that people are a large part of life. They aren't everything there is to life. 10 years later, he said, then the most popular magazine around was Us magazine. Stuckey noted Us is still people, only it's not them, it's only us. He said then 10 years later, the magazine self hit the newsstands. Stuckey said, any day now I expect there to be a new magazine named Me. All it will be is 20 pages of aluminum foil in which you can watch your own reflection. The more we become preoccupied with Me, the less we have an outward focus and we look at others. And so that's why it's so important for us to constantly go to the scriptures and to see where Jesus' focus was and how he focused himself on others. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, which we finally finished our study of after several months, is, is known as the Sermon on the Mount. If I could, I would title Matthew chapter 8 as the Sermon on the Move. Because Jesus takes everything that he's preached for three chapters, and now he takes all these people that follow him, and he says, this is what it looks like if you live it out. See, it's one thing to hear a sermon and to say, yeah, that makes sense. I agree with that. It's quite another thing to live a sermon out, to hear what's said and then put these things into practice. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He takes everything that he's spoken about in his Sermon on the Mount, and now he shows them what it looks like when you live it out in your life. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus meets a leper, a Gentile, a woman, and a demon-possessed man. Now, these four seem very strangely, you know, different, but they all have one thing in common. Each one of them was an outcast from society. Well, let's look at the first one. First, there's a, a leper. L.S. Huizinga, in his book, Unclean, Unclean, wrote, The disease which we today call leprosy generally begins with pain in certain areas of the body. Numbness follows. Soon the skin in such spots loses its original color. It gets to be thick, glossy, and scaly. As the sickness progresses, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and ears, begins to bunch with deep furrows between the swellings. Fingers drop off or are absorbed. Toes are affected similarly. Eyebrows and eyelashes drop out. By this time, we can see the person in this pitiable condition is a leper. One can even smell it, for the leper emits a very unpleasant odor. Moreover, in view of the fact that the disease-producing agent frequently attacks the larynx, the leper's voice acquires a grating quality. Not only can you see, feel, and smell the leper, but you can hear his rasping voice. William Barclay called leprosy death by inches. Once it started, it just didn't stop. Little by little by little, it would consume a person. As bad as the physical effects of leprosy were, the social, emotional, and mental effects were, were equally bad. Leviticus 13 says this, The leper must wear torn clothes. Well, why? They wanted to be easily identifiable so that everyone could avoid them. So, so they had to do certain things so that no one would come in contact with them. The leper must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. 
They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. I'm not sure you can become much more of an outcast than that, can you? You must live alone. You must live outside the camp. If you even see somebody approaching you, you have to warn them so that they will totally avoid you. Chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. I picture it this way. They've just heard this magnificent sermon. And they're thinking, we can't wait to put these things into practice. We can't wait to be the kind of people that Jesus was just talking about. And they come down off the mountain. They're all fired up to live that kind of life. And behold, a leper came. Luke in his gospel said that the man was full of leprosy. In other words, he was in the advanced stages of leprosy. There was no mistaking it. As soon as you looked, you could tell that this man had leprosy and he was in the advanced stages of it. And as soon as they see him, the crowd begins to melt away. They all begin to scatter so that they won't be anywhere near this man except, except for one person. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him. By the way, the Greek for that touched him has, has the force of he, he actually reached out and grabbed a hold of him. He didn't just barely touch him like, eh, I really don't want to do this. He reached out and he grabbed a hold of him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. To me, the most incredible thing about this miracle isn't that Jesus healed him. It's how he healed him. I mean, Jesus, in other instances, he healed with just a word. I think that's what most people would have done. That's fine. I'll take care of healing you. You just stay back there. You know, and I'll do it from a distance. But here's this man who hadn't probably been touched by anyone in years, and Jesus reached out and grabs him and heals him. The essence of Christianity is to touch the untouchable and to love the unlovable. The Menninger Institute in Topeka, Kansas, conducted a, a research study. They found that there were certain children, certain um, you know, infants, children in, in their cribs that didn't cry. And the reason that they didn't, you see, children instinctively know to cry. They instinctively know that's the way to get attention. That's the way for somebody to know that there's something wrong. I need somebody's attention. I, I, I need something. But there were certain crib babies that weren't crying, and it was because they were neglected. They began their lives by crying when they were in need, but after a while, since nobody came, since nobody cared, since they were totally neglected, they stopped crying. It's as if they said, it doesn't work, I might as well just give up. So the Menninger Institute wanted to see, could this all be reversed? And so what they did is they enlisted people from retirement villages and nursing homes. And every day those people would come in and they would pick up those precious babies. And they would just hold them and rock them. And it wasn't long until those children learned again that they could cry out. That someone indeed did care for them. Physical touch made the difference. Charles Colson was the founder of Prison Fellowship. One Christmas, he was out and he went to different prisons to, uh, to preach to the inmates. He was in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And as he went out there on Christmas morning, he went and he preached to a woman's prison. There was about 100 inmates that came out to hear his message. After he finished, the chaplain came to him and said, if you had a couple of moments, would you go talk to Bessie Shipp? He said, who's, who's Bessie Shipp? And the, the chaplain explained, Bessie Ship is in isolation. She has AIDS. Now, this was years ago when we didn't understand how AIDS was transmitted. And, and there was a lot of fear, and Colson said, I was frankly afraid. You know, I didn't know how this was transmitted. Was I going to get it? And he said, my initial thought was to say, boy, I wish I could. <laughs> but I've got another prison that I've got to go to, so I don't have time. And he said, but then I remembered the words of Scripture, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Colson told the chaplain to take him to go see Bessie Ship. Colson wrote this, 
As the chaplain escorted me through two secured areas, he explained that a petition had been presented to the governor for Bessie's release, but it hadn't been acted upon, and she was feeling particularly depressed. The doctors had given her only a few weeks to live. A chill came over me as we swung open the gate to the isolation cell, where a petite young woman sat bundled up in a bathrobe, reading a Bible. She looked up, and her eyes brightened as the chaplain said, I promised I'd bring you a Christmas present, Bessie. We chatted for a few moments, and since there wasn't much time for either of us, I decided I'd better get to the point. Bessie, do you know Jesus, I asked. No, she said, I, I, I try to. I read this book. I want to know him, but I haven't been able to find him. We can settle that right now, I said, taking her hand. The chaplain took her other hand, and together we led Bessie in prayer. When we finished, she looked up at us with tears flowing down her cheeks. It was a life-changing moment for Bessie and for me. Two days later, Governor Jim Martin released Bessie, and she went home to Winston-Salem. There, Bessie studied the Bible, was baptized into a local church, and was visited regularly by Al Lawrence, our prison fellowship area director. She told Al those were the happiest days of her life. Three weeks after her release, Bessie joined the Savior she had so recently come to know. I shuddered later when I thought how close I'd come to avoiding that visit. And since that day, I've never hesitated to walk into an AIDS ward and embrace dying men and women. No heroics on my part, just obedience. Who in your life do you know that's untouchable? It, it may not be AIDS, it may not be leprosy. Maybe it's something else, but, but you know somebody, and they seem to be untouchable. When they come around, everybody gives them a wide berth. No one wants to deal with them. Would you let Christ reach out through you and touch that person who seems untouchable to the rest? Who in your life do you know that's unlovable? By the way, you know the Bible never commands us to like someone, but it does command us to love them. Will you let Christ love that person through you? You know, as I thought about this, I thought about several ministries that we have here at the church. One is the Camden Street Ministry. Once a month, we go down to the streets of Camden to people that feel forgotten, to people that feel unloved, and show the love of Christ to them. Folks get together the night before. They make sandwiches. They put together a lunch. And then we go down to the streets of Camden. We give them food. When it's cold out, we give them clothes. But the most important thing is just to go and to show someone you care. Hey, I wonder if you would even consider that. Maybe that's something that God would have you get involved with. Hey, we, we have room for more to get involved in that ministry to go down and to show the love of Christ to others. By the way, I'm also just so, so excited and thrilled that the women of our church have undertaken a project to show the love of Christ through the Forgotten Initiative. You actually got that in your bulletin today. Let me just take a moment and read what it says. The Forgotten Initiative Service Project. Children often come into foster care with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Those that are foster parents understand that. You know, a kid shows up at your house and they have nothing except what they're wearing. Nothing except the clothes on their backs. Journey bags are backpacks filled with personal and comfort items for children to call their own when they're abruptly taken out of their homes. The goal of journey bags is to bless these kids and to let them know that they're loved, prayed for, and remembered. Please consider donating some of the items listed on the back of this sheet to help us with this project. You know, I wonder if you'd even consider this morning and say, you know what, this is a way that I can show someone that thinks they're forgotten that they're not. That someone they don't even know cares about them and is praying for them. You know, I know we've got one at the back of the church. We've got one at the front of the church. You can just come and simply take a, a slip of paper and provide that. By the way, I'd encourage everyone to at least just take one, just to say that you did something, that you remembered, that you're involved. If you want to take more than one, hey, we can make more slips of paper. 
There's no limit to the number of backpacks we can give out because it seems almost limitless, the children that find themselves in a situation like this. I don't think there's anything as having too many backpacks filled with too many items. Maybe you'd even say, I, I'm going to take it on myself that I'm going, to, I'm going to take one of these columns and I'm going to buy every, you know, everything in one column and I'm going to fill a backpack by myself. Whatever God leads you to do. But I just tell you, it is the essence of Christianity to touch the untouchable, to love the unlovable, and to remember those that others have forgotten. Verse 3 says, immediately the leprosy was cleansed. I picture it this way. One moment this guy is yelling out, unclean, unclean. The next moment he takes a look at himself and he says, I'm clean, I'm clean. As it happens in that split second when Jesus heals him. Verse 4 says, Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Leviticus chapter 14 is a rather neglected portion of Scripture, and it was neglected for this reason. Leviticus chapter 14 told what kind of sacrifice you were to bring when you were cleansed of leprosy. You know the problem with that was why it was so neglected? People didn't get cured of leprosy. As a matter of fact, in 1,500 years, only two people had been cured of leprosy. Moses' sister Miriam, God heals her. And then Naaman, the, 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 the Syrian commander, is miraculously healed of leprosy. Imagine that. The priests that worked in the temple for 1,500 years, nobody came in. For all those years they worked in the temple, there's only been two healings in 1,500 years. Then all of a sudden somebody shows up. Hey, I, I, I'm here to give the offering that goes along with somebody healed of leprosy. That didn't happen. The Bible says it happened as a testimony to them. In other words, now people realize something special was happening. Someone special was here. Next up is the centurion. The centurion was an outcast because he was a Gentile and he wasn't Jewish lived in this Jewish society, and that's why he was an outcast. Centurions were Roman military officials in charge of a hundred people. That's why they got the name centurion. It's like a century is a hundred. A centurion was a military official. He's in charge of a hundred people. And we read about him in verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant, the word for servant there is, talks about a young servant. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. This little boy is at home and he's suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. You know, most of us want to see evidence of something happening before we believe it. You know, we, we even have a saying, we, we, we say, I'll believe it when I, yeah, don't tell me it's going to happen, show me. And after I see it, then I'll believe it. But this man says, I don't have to see it. Lord, if you say, if you say it's done, I'll believe it's done. Well, that's some incredible, that's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. That we would take him at his word and not read his word and say, yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it. But we'll say, if God says it, I believe it. Even if I don't see everything happening that way, I still believe that God is going to be true to his word. See, now the centurion explains why he had this kind of faith in Jesus in verse 9. He says, For I am also man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. The key word there is authority. He says, I, I have authority over 100 men. If I say something's to happen, it happens. No questions asked, it just gets done. And his point is this, Jesus, I believe you have that same kind of authority over everything. And if you say it's done, I don't have to see it, I know it's done. You have authority over all of creation. 
Verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I haven't found such great faith, not even in Israel. There are only two times in the entire Bible where it says Jesus marveled. He marveled here at the faith of this centurion. And the only other time it says Jesus marveled is it says in Mark chapter 6, Jesus marveled over the unbelief of the people of his hometown of Nazareth. It made me think, when God looks at my life and when God looks at your life, what would he be more likely to marvel at? Would he be more likely to marvel at our unbelief? To look at your life and to say, after the goodness I've shown you, after the power I've had, after the way things have worked out all along the way, after the wisdom I've displayed far beyond what you know and understand, you, you doubt me? Boy, that might be a marvel. Or, or maybe Christ would marvel at your faith, just like the centurion that, that, that says, Lord, I, I simply believe that you will always do what's right, and I trust in you to do it. Verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Next up is Peter's mother-in-law. No mother-in-law jokes here, but Peter's mother-in-law is brought up here, and you say, well, why is she an outcast from society? Well, society back then wasn't necessarily very kind to the women in society. Uh, one, One historian wrote, In first century Palestine, a woman's social sphere was only as large as her family. Rabbi Bereshet said it's a way of a woman to stay at home and it's a way of a man to go out into the marketplace. While literacy was an important element in teaching young men to study the Bible, it was a luxury for women. Because the Old Testament was explicit about teaching scripture to the sons, women were excluded from the instruction in the Torah. It wasn't normal for men to speak directly to women. Not only did the gospel show Jesus speaking to women, it depicts him doing so with an element of tenderness. He doesn't simply heal the woman with the bleeding disorder. He calls her daughter. When he addresses the woman doubled over from spiritual oppression, he calls her a daughter of Abraham, conferring on her a spiritual status equal to her male counterparts. Verse 14 Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. That's interesting. I I don't know if you know this. Many of you probably do know this. I actually grew up in in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, two of the things I remember being taught, number one, that, that Peter was the first pope, and the other thing I knew is that priests didn't get married. So I was really, the first time I ever read this verse, I was stunned to realize Peter was married. You know, he had a wife, he had a mother-in-law, so, so, so he was married. You know, it kind of, kind of reminded me, a couple of years ago, I went to, uh, went to Sam's Club to pick up pulpit, or not pulpit, the, the pew Bibles that, that we have in our pews, and I, I went there, and I, I forget, we were ordering 100, 120 pew Bibles. First, I'd just go in and take all the ones they had, and I thought, well, this is crazy going in and getting three or four at a time. So I ordered them, and one day I went in there, and they had this big flatbed thing, and it had like 120 Bibles stacked up on it, and I walked up, you know, to get it. I had reserved it, and uh, when I got there, the guy said, oh, yeah, here are your Bibles right here, Father. <laughs> the Father? And, and then, you know what? I looked, and, and I realized I was wearing a black turtleneck, and I was wearing a black jacket, and I thought, well, that makes sense. I, you know, I did looked at, and I thought, well, I'm, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not going to go explain it to the guy. I know I kind of look like a Catholic priest. And so he said, well, let me give you a hand with that, Father. Oh, okay. So we wheel it out to the car, and as we're going out to the car, we take all these Bibles, and we're starting to pile them in the car, and all of a sudden my cell phone rings. So I reach in my pocket, and I pull it out, and I say, hang on, i got to take this. This is my wife. Should have seen the look on his face. And then I did explain. I said, well, okay, I'm just wearing a turtleneck. And so I explained the whole thing to him so he would understand, didn't have to report me to the diocese or whatever would go on there. But it says this in verse 15. So he touched her hand 
and the fever left her. And she arose and served them. Now, a skeptic might say, oh, her fever just broke. Come on. This, this, this is no miracle. How, how many of you have ever had a fever? Yeah, pretty much everybody. The moment your fever breaks, does all your energy return to you? No, you're still wiped out. This is a miracle. You know, here she is. Jesus doesn't just take the fever from her. All of a sudden, all her energy returns, and she jumps up, and she starts to, to serve everyone. Lepers were outcast in Jewish society. Gentiles were outcast in Jewish society. Women were outcast in Jewish society. But our last one deserves its own special category, the demon-possessed. Boy, talk about the person that everyone would avoid and not want to have anything to do with. Verse 16, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Did you notice how Jesus healed each one differently? With the leper, the person that, that no one would get near, he reaches out and he grabs hold of him. With, with the centurion who has great faith, he rewards his great faith. And he says, I'll do it your way. I'll speak just a word. And your servant is healed. With Peter's mother-in-law, it's just a gentle touch on the hand. And with these demons, just to show his power over Satan, just a word. And they're gone. Verse 16 says, Jesus healed all who were sick. Just the other day, I came across this headline. Parents pray for drowned two-year-old until miracle brings her back from the dead. I thought, you know, that's wonderful. But I think the confusing thing for us is that's not everyone's experience, is it? There are people you know that you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you say, why isn't this my experience? Verse 16 says, Jesus healed all who were sick. Why is that not my experience? First of all, I'd tell you this. God didn't heal everyone in the Bible that was sick, did he? Do you remember David? His son is sick, he's near death, and he pleads with God. Here's a man after God's own heart. He pleads with God. He fasts, he prays, he refuses to eat, he, he pleads with God, and God takes his son home to be with him. And David understands that even when I don't understand it, God's way is our best. Paul, Paul prayed fervently three times that this thorn in the flesh would be removed from him. And God doesn't remove it. But Paul says through this experience, he came to understand that God's grace was sufficient for him. We don't know why God chooses to heal in one case and not in another. What we do know is this. God is too wise to make a mistake. God is too kind to do anything cruel. And everything God does comes from a heart of love, whether we understand it or not. Whenever you pray for healing, and I, and I think we ought to for, for those that we love, but whenever you pray for healing, trust in God's wisdom to know what's best and trust in his goodness to give what's best, whether we understand it or not. So why did Jesus heal all the sick that came to him in Matthew chapter 8, I think there's a reason, if you just flip over and we'll close with this, turn to Matthew chapter 11, because I think there's a reason that in this case, Jesus healed everyone that was brought to him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, and when John, that's John the Baptist, and when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one? And by the coming one, he means the Messiah. Are you the promised Messiah that we have been looking for for all these years? Or do we look for another? 
Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. When Jesus was asked if he was the Messiah, he pointed to the healings that he did. You see, the Old Testament said when the Messiah was present on earth, he'd do all these miracles of healing. So you see, the most important thing wasn't the healing itself. The most important thing was that people came to know who Jesus is. You know, and the same thing is true today. Sometimes it's through the sickness that someone comes to know who Jesus is, comes to know him as Savior. Sometimes it's through the sickness that someone has the same experience as Paul. They learn that God's grace is sufficient, and they come to know him in a deeper, in a deeper way. But let me just get back in closing to what the chapter is all about. Jesus loves the outcasts. Someone wrote, I imagine it this way. Jesus walks into a room and makes a beeline to the outcast. He chooses to go where love hasn't yet arrived. His ways aren't our ways, but they could be. And I might add, they ought to be. Let's pray together. 